And a really warm welcome here to our central kind of training evening. We're doing this over the next um, three Wednesdays. Um, so we had our prayer gathering um, last Wednesday. And as we wait for people to kind of arrive and join, we gather together as um, Inspire Groups and as a church family. It gives us an opportunity to meet centrally and to get to know one another before in October we go off to our Inspire Groups. It also gives us the, the opportunity to do some training together. So get some things that we think are really important for you as Inspire group members and as church family and to do the training all together. And so this evening we're going to be looking at how to read, understand and apply the Bible. Next week we're going to be looking at real change which is about applying the Bible to our hearts and our desires to help us to change in the gospel. And then the week after that we'll be looking at pastoral care and um, the pastoral care uh, that we have here in the church family and how that works out in Inspire Groups and in the church family more generally. But this evening, we're going to be thinking about how to read and understand and apply the Bible. And in some sense, this is a really, um, well, probably one of the most important evenings that we could do, because there's nothing more important than having God speaking into your life, day by day, moment by moment, week by week. And we want to be a church family here where you are trained and equipped and released to be opening God's Word every day and to be hearing God's voice speaking into your life. I mean, our number one value is biblical preaching, so we place a high priority on the importance of hearing God on Sunday in the sermons. And what we then do as we gather as the Inspire Groups is to open up God's Word and understand what the sermon was saying and then seek to apply it into our lives. But not only that for the context of Inspire Groups, but also for your own personal walk, we want to really emphasize to you the importance of daily Bible reading. You, in your own time that you have in the morning or in the evening, um, opening up God's Word and listening to God's voice speaking to you day by day. Um, there was a survey that was done in America of 5,000 churches, and it found that the number one thing that leads to personal growth and the number one thing that leads to church growth is unsurprisingly personal Bible reading, daily Bible reading. So can I encourage you, um, as we do this evening, this is partly what we're, we're trying to do. We're trying to equip you to be able to do that. But also, if you're not in the habit of doing that, don't feel any embarrassment at all. Um, but maybe speak to someone, grab Mark or me at the end, or Kale, who heads up our discipleship, would love to talk to you. And we can equip you and give you some resources that would help with that. But anyway, that's why this evening is so important, to be training you to feed yourself in some ways um, as you read and understand the Bible. So let me pray, and then I'll take us through just the very first bit of introduction, and then most of this evening is going to be interactive. That is, you're going to be doing the grunt work in your groups, so I hope you've come prepared to chat and to engage and to try to do this, because in some ways, the best way to train you is to get you doing it straight away. And I'm conscious as we do that, some will have done something like this before. For some, this will be completely new, so we're all coming from different perspectives. So let's pray that God would help us, and then we'll dive in. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word, um, the Bible. Thank you that you are a God who speaks. Um, that is, you don't leave us ignorant about who you are, about who we are, and about the nature of the world. But as you speak, you reveal to us the nature of your character and your grace and your love, the nature of the world and who we are and how we wish to relate to you. But also, as you speak to us, you establish and maintain and cultivate a relationship with us. It's an incredible thing to have you, the living God, speaking to us. Help us, therefore, this evening to be better equipped to hear your voice and to understand what you say and to apply it into our lives. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, look, as a way of starting, um, one of the ways you can get yourself into difficulty when you come to reading a book is if you misunderstand the type of book that you're dealing with. I mean, it's a, it's an, in a trivial point in some senses, but actually very important that if you go to the library and you pick up a book and you get it in the wrong category, you'll make some mistakes. Years ago, actually, um, this was a particular problem when Dan Brown wrote The Da Vinci Code. I remember like intelligent people coming to me as a Christian and saying, what do you make of Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code? Is it undermining your faith? And I said, well, it's a work of fiction. Why would a work of fiction undermine my faith? They said, oh, but it's based on truth. Yeah, like in the really loose kind of way in that it's based in the world and the world is true. But apart from that, there's not much truth to it at all. But they were misreading the book. They were taking a work of fiction and implying that it would have some kind of historical basis. It had none at all and therefore didn't rock any Christian's faith, I hope, at all. 
Well, in a very different way, um, but the same point applies. If we misunderstand the Bible as the nature of the Bible and the type of book it is, we'll get into trouble. And what I want you to see from that um, quote from 2 Peter at the top is that the Bible is both a divine book, but it's a divine book that has been written by human authors as God has worked through them. So look at 2 Peter 1 at the top. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Notice that the intention and the direction and the impetus for the Bible does not come from human will. So it is not the case that some people who are bright sat around a number of years ago and said, I don't know, let's try and work out what God is like. And let's write a book about that. That would be good. And then let's talk about Jesus Christ and let's come up with Christianity. That's not, Peter says that's explicitly not what happened. It did not have its origin in human will. This is God's word. Um, this is God breathed. This is God inspired. This is God directed. This is God's word. The origin is from God. And that should be greatly reassuring to us. But it is also not true that God just kind of zapped it down from heaven and it just appeared one day and there it was, this divine book. No, no. God spoke through human authors. Though it says, um, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So you've got a divine book that has been mediated through human authors. So it's divine and also human. Therefore, there's a number of implications. First of all, if you're dealing with a divine book, it would stand to reason, wouldn't it, that you would need God's help in reading it? I mean, my ways are not your ways, says the Lord, my, nor are my thoughts your thoughts, but as far as the heavens are above the earth, so far above are my ways from your ways. In other words, you've got no chance of understanding God unless he does a work in your life. So the first thing, come to the word of God, you must pray. Because otherwise, how are you going to understand the words of the living God? He's so much greater than us, so much more intelligent than us. The things he's got to reveal to us will stretch us. We have to pray and ask humbly for his help. So first rule of reading the Bible is come to the Bible humbly. Realize you're dealing with the very words of the living God here. The words which have sufficient power to form the universe, to shape the universe, to bring life and to bring death. This is the living God's word. So pray, approach it with humility. So that's the first part. The second part, though, is it is a book that has been written down by human authors. And therefore, it will obey the normal rules of human writing. And you guys are really good at reading human books. You do it all the time. Now, of course, I'm conscious that we've got mixed um, educational levels, uh, mixed experiences reading. Some will love it, some will find it difficult, some may have dyslexia and find it challenging for particular reasons. But all of you will be able to read and all of you will be able to and are used to dealing with human writing. And therefore, the other problem that often happens with the Bible is people try to treat it in a way that is completely unrealistic to the way we normally deal with writing. So in some sense, what we're doing this evening is just unpacking how you normally read but also doing that in a way that is reverent and humble before God. So it's not like the Bible suddenly obeys completely different rules for when you read it. And so if in going through the process of, you know, showing you how you actually normally read something that gets a little bit too kind of formulaic, bear with it, because what we're trying to do is, is explain to you something you do quite intuitively and you've been doing intuitively for a long period of time. Um, so this is trying to help you. It's not trying to put a rigid process in because I imagine when you read most books, you don't go through observation, interpretation, application. You just read it and understand and do that intuitively. But because the Bible is so special, we do want to slow down a bit and try and unpack your processes. So that's what we're doing this evening. So it's a divine book and it's also a human book and it needs to be treated as such. So approach it with humility, but also apply the normal rules of reading and context and things like that to it. So three stages we're going to look at this evening to understand um, the Bible and to apply it. Um, the first one is observation. Um, we're going to need to slow down and read the text and really observe what is going on in the text. Just kind of getting the facts on the table. Do I really understand what the text is actually saying? Um, asking the simple question, what does it actually say? One of the big problems we have when we come to scripture is we jump to application. We immediately want to know what God is saying to me and therefore we rush beyond the detail and we miss important detail and we jump to, a, to a, an application that won't be legitimate or helpful. 
So we need to slow down a bit, and we've got a particular tool for doing that called the paragraph tool. Then after you've got the kind of facts on the table, just understanding what it says, we then need to understand what it means. That's what's its significance. Um, how do we interpret it? Um, and to do that, we're going to look at the importance of context. Notice that when it comes to interpretation, you often hear people say things like, oh, well, that's just your interpretation, and I might have a different interpretation. Interestingly, people really never do that with like legal contracts. That's just your legal interpretation. I don't interpret it that way. No, no, there's like a generally accepted way of interpreting it. That's because context gives us the meaning. And so we're going to do what we normally do, which is you place something in its context, and that is how you interpret it. Um, understanding why it's put there and what it was initially intended to do, that will help you with interpretation. And then finally, we move from that to application, how we actually apply it today and how we avoid some of the pitfalls of taking a 2,000-year-old text and misreading it in a way for today. So that's where we're going. Let's start, first of all, with um, observation. What does it say? Um, it's important to know, and there's no reason that you might necessarily know this, that the paragraph and verse divisions in the Bible are not there in the original text. So when the Greek or the Hebrew was written down, um, in the Greek there were no verse divisions of numbers and things like that. They came later. And equally, the structuring of the paragraphs that you have on the pages of your NIV or your ESV, if you've ever compared them, you'll notice they're different. That's because they're put there by translators to help you read it. They're not there in the original. Now, that's not a bad thing that they're put there. I'm not making a point about that. I'm just saying that they have made the decision about putting those paragraphs there and putting the verses there to try to help you read it. But one of the ways that you can slow yourself down and observe the text is by asking, if you were to do that, where would you put them? So just reading the text afresh, taking, if you like, the paragraph breaks out of it and the sentence breaks out of it, where would you? do the divisions. And that, what that does, the reason to do that is I'm not suggesting you have to do this every time, but it slows you down, it helps you look at the text afresh, and it helps you understand what's going on with the text. Now, the best way to do this is for you to actually do it, and then you'll see how it functions. So, you've got this text from Mark chapter 8. We're going to be studying Mark later on this term, so this is a spoiler alert. You get a, a head start with this. And what I want you to do in your groups is to go through that bit under point one, group work. Imagine you had to put the paragraph divisions in. Where would you put them and why? Try to do this by marking up the text of Mark 8 on the following page. Okay, so do that bit initially. Get a pen, discuss as a group, and try and work out. And the process of you discussing as a group, oh, I think the paragraph division should go here, will help you understand the text. Let me just say one thing. Paragraph divisions are put there when you kind of get a chunk of text together that's making a similar point. So that's why we normally do paragraphs, is that we're making a similar point. And when a new point is made, or when there's a movement in the text, that's normally where we put paragraphs in. Now, it's a bit of an art, it's not a science, it's not like there's a right and a wrong answer, so that's the beauty of it, you can all have a go. But it gets you into understanding what's going on in the text, and you'll start to notice the details as you have to try to work out where you would put the paragraph. So have a go, see what you make of it, um, be as creative as you like, discuss it in your groups, and I'll be coming around if it's totally opaque and you're finding it very confusing, we'll see where we go. And if you do A of group work, then go on to B and C, all right? So do that whole first bit of group work if you can, and then I'll draw us back together and see where we're up to. Over to you. I don't know how you found that. Some of you might be familiar with that. Others, I'm conscious that's the first time you've done that and you're thinking it's a little bit strange. Stick with it. What we'll do now is we'll get a bit of feedback um, from groups as to where you put the divisions. This is not you know, to kind of come up with one right interpretation, but it's more to draw out because the process in this is almost or probably as important as the answer you come up with. Because hopefully you notice what happens as you do this, even if you're familiar with the passage, is it first of all slows you down, stops you just reading through and saying, yes, I know what this passage is about. And by having to make the decisions about where you would put the break, you start to observe the text more closely and observe what's going on in the text more closely. And one of, our, I think, our big problems when we come to the Bible is we, we read it too quickly. We assume we know what it means before we've really observed the detail. and let it speak to us. So part of this process is slowing us down, but also you'll see the other benefits hopefully now. So 
who as a group wants to be kind of brave enough to say, this is where we thought the divisions are? I'm not going to kind of say, I can't believe you put it there. Um, so throw it out, and then we'll see where others were at, and we'll have a little discussion as to why one place over the other. So who wants to volunteer their paragraph divisions? Evie, thank you. OK, so two breaks, one just before verse 27, thank you, and one just before verse 31. Could I ask you, since you've been kind enough to speak up on that, why did you put them there? Just give us your rationale. Okay, so there's three different topics covered. Do you want to say what those different topics are? Yeah, give us your titles. That's good, helpful. Okay, Jesus heals the blind man. Jesus' identity, or, yeah, and then Jesus teaches about his death. Really helpful, thank you. What's really helpful, uh, by the way, about those... Um, those titles is that they're not trying to apply it. You're not trying to interpret it at the moment. You're just, just at the moment being restrained, not jumping forward, just describing what is happening. He heals a blind man. There's a discussion about his identity. He teaches about his death. Facts on the table, just so you can kind of get that. Um, does anyone want to kind of propose alternative paragraph divisions? Or is it so obvious that you're all going with that? I don't know. What do people think? Is there any dissenting voices? Amazing. Okay, there we are. Um, when you're looking at it, how did you decide? So what are the different ways? Let me phrase it differently. What are the different ways you were able to decide where to put the divisions? So Evie's you know, put one of the things on the table, which they seem to be dealing with a kind of common issue or common theme in those particular verses. But there are other things going on in the text that could give markers as well. So what were those other things that could help you decide? Yeah. Brilliant. Different settings. So this happens a lot with um, narratives, but Mark is a particularly an author who does this. He, he uses the settings almost like a modern person would use a camera lens. You kind of switch away. So um, you have the setting, Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi, so they're now moving in verse 27. Um, and then that helps you realize there's a movement in the text. Okay, so that's one way to do it. Um, any other ways you could, you could decide where to put the paragraphs, Rose? Ah, brilliant. Thank you. Let me just repeat it so everyone heard it. So at 30.31, there's a switch from kind of just looking at what happens to actually Jesus teaching, the switch of Jesus teaching. So it can be a switch of the kind of mode of your discussion or mode of the discourse of what's going on as well. There can be a switch of scene. So all of these ways, yes. Verse 31 said, yeah. Thank you, there's a difference in emotion and in tone. Really, really good. Again, so notice that's going on there. It changes from being quite just descriptive and easy goesy to suddenly you've got this um, rebuke with Peter going on. It gets quite heated. Yeah, very helpful. Rebecca, did you want to say something? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, did, so let me just repeat it so everyone can hear that. We're, we're looking at time words. So when he had, verse 23, middle of, and then um, uh, we've got a movement of um, then he went and did this in verse 31. He then began to, so chronology, different time as well. John is an author who makes a lot of time passing, and um, for example. And sometimes, of course, when you're looking at the paragraphs, you will be noticing a few of those different things happening at the same time, and you'll have to make a decision what, which is most important. Again, let me just re-emphasize what I said at the beginning. You, you normally do this intuitively. You're doing this when you read a newspaper article or reading a magazine or reading a, a novel. You do these things intuitively. It's how you understand. What we're trying to do here is just help you deconstruct 
what you do intuitively so that you get a sense of what to look for. One of the other things you can look for is sometimes repeated words or repeated themes. Um, so sometimes you might have kind of themes of, for example, blindness and sight and eyes all in one setting. And you're going, oh, okay, there seems to be these repeated themes around that. And again, that helps you understand maybe what this particular bit is about or when it transitions from that to another bit. Good, really helpful. Oh, and then the other thing that someone said um, was, I think Rebecca said, linking words. Sometimes you have therefore, which links back to, or consequently, or then, or because. And so sometimes those linking words help you see as well. Again, don't get too hung up on it, but it's just helpful because it slows you down and seeing the different ways that you're doing it. Who wants to try and give an overall title for the, for the piece? We've got kind of re reasonable unity around the paragraphs. We've had a suggestion of good headings for those paragraphs. Who wants to give an overall title attempt? It's quite tough, I know, but who wants to have a go? Paul. So a bit of a discussion around Jesus' work, his identity, his mission, which fits the three divisions, so it kind of fits that. Or then you're talking about Jesus' identity and mission. You going to say something, Emma? Okay, Jesus heals and teaches. Thank you. Anyone else want to give a... Yes. Or walking by faith, not by sight. Okay, now, this is not that that's wrong at all, but at the moment, what we're trying to do in some sense is purely describe what's going on. So you're just starting to make the transition to the next bit we're coming to, which is interpreting it and starting to give some sense of the meaning of it. And it's really difficult to kind of hold yourself back. Um, and we'll see why in a moment we just want to hold back a little bit, but that's, you're just kind of going on to that. And the part of the challenge is the way that the passage is, you kind of think, why does Mark put... The, um, the discussion about Jesus being the Christ and this rebuke with Peter next to the seemingly unrelated issue of this man born blind. And so partly you're getting into the kind of reconciling those. Interesting, over at Andy Hood's group and Imogen's group over here, when I asked them, they said they couldn't commit to an overall title because that would be to give the game away about why Mark is putting those two together. So you see the challenge with it a little bit. Also, one of the other things when you read the Bible as well is to, if you notice things which are kind of strange or you kind of go, huh, that's a little bit odd. I, I wonder why that's happening. Don't lose that. That's really important. What was some of the obvious things that you noticed here that you just kind of went, that is strange? I mean, there's one particular aspect of it that I'm expecting you'll say, but what was strange in this passage? Andy? It's very clear that Jesus seemingly doesn't get the job done first time. Aha. Right. Very weird that Jesus seemingly doesn't get the job done first time with the healing. Like, is he, is he having a bad day? It's like, oh, shoot, the magic is not in my fingertips today. I mean, you know, like you, you read it. Now, as a Christian, please never lose the surprise. Because when a person who's not a Christian reads the Bible, that's like the first thing they notice. And for you to kind of go, oh, yes, well, that's because of this, just kind of completely loses all the surprise. And interestingly, when you read the New Testament, the most common reaction to Jesus is surprise. He's just so astonishing. Everything he does and he says is different to what you'd expect. So don't lose the surprise and don't try and like gloss over it. And if you're not sure why it's there, there's usually, that's, that's the kind of the grit and the oyster that will make the pearl. So actually notice that and log that. So one of the really surprising things here is what's going on with Jesus seemingly having an off day? I mean, why, why is that happening? And that's actually going to be really key to the piece. So we're going to have to try and work that through. Um, let's think about context, and then what we're going to do is I'll teach on context, we'll then have a break, and then we'll kind of come back to it. So let me do a bit on the context. Context is really important in everyday life. Um, we, if you get context wrong, then you kind of get it wrong at, um, at your peril. Um, I remember when I was in Uganda um, uh, with a friend of mine, and he asked me to do something, and I just kind of said, yep, yeah, no problem, I'll do that, and did that to me. And he came up to me and he said, you, you can't do that. You can't do that. And I said, what? He said, put your thumb up. I said, why not? He says, it, it means you're voting in a particular way for the ruling party who are not popular in this region. Don't do that. So I was doing, in the UK, a very innocuous gesture, and he was saying, uh-uh, don't do that here. <laughs> it's like hand gesture in a different context means a very different thing. 
One of the big problems we consistently have with the Bible is when someone takes a text out of its context to try to make a point that it was never intended to make. And as it is sometimes being said, a text out of its context is a proof text. In other words, you're just trying to get it to prove whatever you want to say. Um, flick forward in your Bibles to Romans 8.28. This is a very famous proof text. I'm sure in certain parts of the world, well, I know in certain parts of the world, Romans 8.28 is plastered all over bumper stickers. I once watched a um, boxing program. It was kind of like a reality TV boxing show where this um, different contestants came together and they had to try and win the overall, you know, kind of boxing match, boxing against one another in the kind of knockout um, rounds, pun intended. And um, uh, there's one guy who was going into a fight and he was interviewed before the fight. He said, how do you think he's going to do? And he was a Christian. Um, and he said, I know I'm going to win. I know I'm going to have the victory. And the interviewer said, oh, how do you know that? And he said, and he quoted Romans 8.28. And he said, well, I know I'm going to have the victory because we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, so I'm going to win. Well, he got a tough lesson on context because he got knocked out in the first round. <laughs> and he was really devastated afterwards, and I just kind of thought, ah, oh, you just haven't understood context. Because when Paul writes, we know that in all things God works together for the good of those who love him, to understand the meaning of that verse, you have to put it in its context, so read on. What is the good? Is the good being victorious, or is the good being rich, or is the good being beautiful, or is the good finding your life partner? Well, no. Verse 29, the good is this. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. In other words, what God thinks is good in your life is making you more and more like Jesus. And that can mean sometimes going through really difficult times where you're humbled and you're laid low to be taught that you need to rely on Jesus more. And that's what happened to this man. So actually in his life, he did live out Romans 8, 28. It just wasn't the way he thought it was going to work out for him. He was made more like Jesus by being humbled and experiencing suffering and experiencing difficulty. So you see, you take the text out of its context, you have a proof text. Now that's true with individual verses. It's also true with passages. So you'll see that I say there in the, in the handout, context is like an onion. It has layers. And so you always need to work hard to put the passage back into its context. And there are layers to that. So you take the individual passage or verse, and then you need to put the other layer around it, which is that, pass, that verse, Romans 8, 28, for example, is placed within the wider passage of that particular part of Romans 8, which is all about growing in the likeness of Jesus Christ. And then you want to put it in the wider context of that kind of section of the book or that chapter. Um, and in that section of the book or chapter in Romans, for example, it's all about growth in godliness from Romans chapter 5 through to Romans chapter 8. So Romans 8, 28 is about the good life of growing in the likeness of Christ, which is there in the context of the passage, which is all about in a wider context of the chapter about growing in godliness. And this is all in the context of a book. And the book of Romans is all about the power of the gospel to accomplish this work of salvation in your life. And salvation doesn't just mean in Romans getting over the line or praying a prayer, but it means growing in Christ-likeness. It means the full gambit of all that God wants to do in your life. So it's a big picture view of the gospel. And then, of course, this is in the context as well of the whole Bible, which is all... And you suppose you could split that up with the Testaments as well in the Bible, which is all about Jesus. So it's about the gospel, which glorifies Jesus by showing you his work of salvation in your life. And you see how it's all related. So you go through those layers. And this is how you interpret the passage. So what we will need to do when we come back from our break is we're going to look at this passage of Mark chapter 8. And I'm going to give you a little piece on it at the moment, which is Romans, uh, sorry, Mark chapter 1 through to Mark chapter 8 is all about the identity of Jesus, all about who is Jesus. Um, is he the Christ? Is he the Son of God? Who is he? That's the big question that kind of runs through the whole of the first part of Mark chapter 8. And so knowing that it's all about Jesus and now seeing that you've got this bit about a blind man whose eyes are healed in two stages and then you've got this discussion of who is Jesus going on, 
when you come back from the break, you're going to need to discuss why, the, the kind of the why question. What does this mean? Um, why is it put together like this? And the text, in its context, will give you its meaning. Okay, that's where we're going. But I think now's a good time for have a break. So five minute break, grab your coffees and teas and things like that. You can discuss this as you do it, but then we'll draw us back together and we'll get into, into the bit afterwards. Okay. So as we come back together, what I'd like you to do is go straight into your groups. And if you turn over the page um, that you've got, then you'll see group work. Go back to your passage. And I'd like you to discuss why do you think Mark has put the healing of the blind man next to the discussion of who do people say that I am? And note this is all in a section of Mark that's about the identity of Jesus primarily. So once you've had that discussion, then try to write a one sentence for it. Not a paragraph, a sentence, so it's good to restrict yourself to a small bit. Um, and it's a theme sentence, a kind of one sentence summary of the meaning of the passage. Please note, this is not yet the application of the passage. This is not saying what you should do or think or feel differently on the back of it. That comes later. We're not at that stage. This is the theme of the passage. What's the meaning of the passage? Passage. Why has Mark written it in this you know, particular context? Okay, So discuss it, particularly discuss that twin stage healing and the discussion of the Christ. What's it doing there? Work it out and then try and come up with a sentence that you as a team are happy with and then we'll feed back over to you. Okay, let me draw us back together. Some really good discussions going on. And it would just be helpful to have a, a kind of together listen in to your discussion. So as you were looking at these different passages, what was the kind of thing you're grappling with? So as Mark's putting these together, what was the kind of question you're trying to work out? Who wants to just give us a window into what you were grappling with in your groups or in your group? Yeah. Thank you. So why is Jesus revealing himself and then seems to not want people to fully know? Yeah, and then he says, don't tell them. So there's this kind of, why is Jesus being a bit obscure? Doesn't he want everybody to know who he is if it's all about Mark's identity? Thank you. And as you got into this discussion of this strange two-stage healing and why it was put there, um, next to the other passages, what did you think was kind of going on? Why did Mark compose his material like this? Why did he put the miracle of the two-stage healing next to these other passages about the discussion of Jesus' identity and then about um, the rebuking, the telling off of Peter? Rose. Really helpful. I'm getting nods from other people. Is that what other people kind of got? So this two-stage physical healing is a kind of an illustration of this, of what's going on in the life of Peter. And therefore, you know, as Peter is often the spokesperson in Mark's gospel for the other disciples, what's going on in the disciples? They kind of see, they're starting to see, but they don't yet fully see. When he says, you are the Christ, you kind of think, bingo, wrap up Mark's gospel, move on, we're done. But then straight afterwards, you kind of go, oh, he doesn't really see. So he's, he's there, but he's not there. He hasn't fully got his spiritual sight. Who wants to have a go? Like, what is it that Peter doesn't see? You know, so what is, what is, where is the blindness still in, in Peter? What is it that he's not fully getting or grasping about the Messiah? Did you discuss that? Yes, Anne. Uh -huh. Really good. He doesn't see Jesus' mission. And this is the turning point of Mark's gospel. And the second half of Mark's gospel is going to be revealing to us, the readers, and to the disciples, you know, and so they're, as we're brought along with them, 
what Jesus' mission is. You get his identity as the Christ. Big question, but what kind of Christ? The Christ means the anointed one, the king. What is the king coming to do? How is the king going to accomplish that? What is you know, the mission of the king? That's exactly the issue, and Peter doesn't get that. Um, he has this particular idea of, um, of what it involves, and he certainly doesn't get that Jesus has to suffer and die. That's not in his view of the Messiah, still not in many view of people's messiahs um, today. So that's what Peter's going to have to see. Really helpful. Did anyone have a go at a, um, a, a theme sentence for it? And, you know, kind of can give us that as a, as a kind of a go. Anyone have a go at a theme sentence, or were you in the midst of your discussions? If you had a theme sentence, are you going to be brave enough to have a crack? Say it to the public. Go on, group over here. What did you guys come up with? Okay. The disciples see partially who Jesus is. Good theme. Since that gives you the stuff on the table. Yeah? And you could develop it a little bit if you wanted to get into what they see partially. They see partially that Jesus is the Christ, but they don't see yet this. But see partially who Jesus is. That's really helpful. So do you see, and part of the, the, the brilliance of, of reading Scripture and reading the Gospels is trying to work out why does the writer, the author, um, put this passage next to this passage? What's it trying to do? Um, all the Gospel writers do this in different ways. Mark particularly likes his kind of sandwiches, where he sandwiches two bits of material either side of one, and he likes these kind of bits where he puts something next to it as well um, to explain it. And often the miracles that Jesus does explain something about the discourse he's having with his disciples um, later on. So you get this commonly coming up. And that's part of the thrill of reading the Bible is actually that sense of discovery. Um, before we move on out to application, can I just say what we're training you in right now is there's nothing more sophisticated to this than what Mark and I and other preachers do when we preach to you on a Sunday. This is the work we do in the study during the week. We pray, we open up scripture first before we read commentaries, and we, we just do this work, and we go through these stages. We carefully read the passage, try to slow ourselves down, note the things that are really going on, understand, just ask, do we actually understand what's happening? Um, which bits don't we get? Which bits are confusing? And then we start trying to put it together, put the text back into its context. So there's nothing kind of more sophisticated. I was joking with Pete Sinclair, it's not like we kind of go into our studies and then a puff of smoke emerges from the chimney and we arrive and here's the sermon. This, this is the process. This is what we do. And we just do this week by week by week. And it's always interesting. And it's always kind of, you know, you get surprised by and you hadn't noticed that. And that's what results in the sermon. So in some sense, we're just giving you the working that we do. Um, so don't think there's any kind of magical quality or something. You probably don't anyway. Um, but don't think that there's some kind of hidden method of, of discerning getting a sermon. And therefore, we really want you guys to be also discussing with us and saying, well, it's interesting. You made the point in your sermon, but as I read it, I'm not really sure I would have quite seen it that way. We love those discussions. That's a great discussion for the church family to be having. That's getting, you know, kind of God's word opening, grappling with it. The Bereans in the, in the book of Acts are commended for being of noble character because they grapple to see that what the apostles are saying is true. So please be doing that with us. Uh, we often kind of think, ah, we didn't get that quite right, and we'd love your input on that. It is a community thing. So now that you know kind of what we're doing, please come back and push us and ask questions. That would be great. It would be really good for us to do. Let's now move on to then the final bit to application, which in some senses can be the tricky bit to understand because what we're doing so far um, with the understanding what does it say and what does it mean, we kind of do that really commonly. The challenge we've got now is that when the Bible was written was a long time ago. It was written 2,000 years ago. And the cultural setting that it was written into was very different in some ways to our cultural setting today. Um, and so, therefore, some of the things that you're called to do in the cultural setting of the day would not be applicable in the same way today. Let me give you a really obvious example. Um, back then, in the cultural setting of the day, as is talked about in 1 Corinthians 11, when it's talking about prophesying, that is, um, teaching God's word, women are called to wear a hat um, or to wear a covering on their head. And Paul says, as a sign of submission to your husband, recognizing your husband, now, obviously then, 2,000 years ago, in Corinth, you know, if a woman was in public and took her head covering off, there would be a sense in which, oh, wow, she's making a statement about she's no longer kind of in a relationship with her husband or acknowledging the authority or, and the headship of her husband. If you came in today and had a hat on in church and then you took your hat off, I don't think we'd all go, 
because it just it means a very different thing culturally, right? Think of the thumbs up, thumb down, you know, kind of example. So partly the challenge with application is to say that not all the cultural norms of the setting back then scan to today. And so this is partly what you're doing with the application is you're trying to make sure you, you get the principle right, but you don't just straight kind of go, oh, therefore that means that we all want women to be wearing hats in church today because the cultural setting is different. So just a, a kind of health warning on this, this is a bit different because we're dealing with an old text that's 2,000 years old, and therefore we've got to kind of get the cultural setting right. So basically, the way that the application works, and you'll see a diagram under point number three there, is the tendency is, when we read the Bible, is to go, okay, I've worked hard at understanding what it says, I've got my theme, I know what it means, or why it was written, and therefore, all I need to do now is go, oh, and that therefore means for me a bunch of things, and just do that application today. That, that seems like the most intuitive thing to do. That is not what we do. Okay, if we do that, we're going to get into trouble when we start reading texts like 1 Corinthians 11 or Hebrews and things like that. We're going to get into trouble with that. What we actually first of all need to do is we need to work out what this was saying to the people then. So back then, when this was written, it was saying a particular thing. And then you kind of distill from that the principle. And you apply the principle to us today. So you don't do that. Instead, you've got to go to them then and then take it forward from that. You've got to do that two-stage work. Now, just a word about the diagram. This does not mean that God is not speaking to us directly today by his word, by his spirit. That's not what this diagram is illustrating. He does speak directly. It's asking you, how does he speak directly? He speaks directly to you today through a 2,000-year-old book by the work of the spirit that once you work out the application to them then, you can apply faithfully to us today, right? So he speaks directly, but he does it this method. Um, so, for example, let me go back to the hat example. The principle, the application there is women should wear a hat when prophesying in church. Then. The principle is they do that to show a proper orderliness in their social relations in church. Because it was chaotic in the Corinthian church and women were trying to get one over men and men were trying to shout over the women and it was disorder and it was chaos. And Paul's saying that's not how church should be. When it comes to church, there should be order, there should be harmony, there should be mutual love and submission. And therefore, it's really important that the women don't just try and get one over the men and speak up and speak more loudly. And it's really important that the men love and serve the women. And the way that you did that in the setting then was by wearing a hat for women. Okay, so that's the, the principle is about orderliness in worship. The principle is about women um, acknowledging you know, the headship of their husbands. Um, the principle is about husbands loving their wives and um, helping them to flourish. That's the principle that needs to be applied. Okay, it's not just straight wear a hat. Now, there are some churches where people do have to wear hats, um, and often it's because they've slightly misapplied that verse, for example. Okay, does that make sense? Let me give you another one just so you get it. Hebrews, the book of Hebrews is written in a context where people then were tempted to go back to the Old Testament sacrifices. Okay, now, if you were to read Hebrews today, you might, you might see an exhortation, don't go back to Old Testament sacrifices. And if you were just trying to apply that, you'd be thinking, well, that's got nothing to say to me today. I don't fancy going and grabbing a goat and reeling into church and taking it up onto the lovely old table there and sacrificing it. In fact, that's horrific to me. Why would I do that? So therefore, does Hebrews have nothing to say to us today? Well, no, the reason that people then were prone to going back to the Old Testament sacrifices is because they wanted something tangible. Because believing in Jesus just seems too intangible to immaterial. I, I want something I can touch and something I can see and something I can, you know, kind of feel. And Jesus, he's not here physically, so I want something tangible. So the temptation was to therefore make religion and worship in very tangible ways more important than faith in Jesus Christ. Well, now do you see the principle? That's got lots for us to say today in a materialistic age, right? When people will only believe the things that they can see. And the principle of Hebrews is the things you can't see in Jesus Christ are more important and more real than the things you can see in the world. Well, now suddenly we're talking and we're having a good application. So you have to go to them then and then apply the principle. And that's how you get faithful application, which is again why when we preach, Mark and I and other preachers will often tell you about the setting then and tell you about how it applied to people then. And then we do the move to application for us today. 
Does that make sense? Let me just pause, because it might not for some, and it's fine to ask a question just for clarity before we try and do the application piece. Yes, Charlotte. Really good question. Yeah, so how do you work out the principle? One of the, the, the helpful things to think is that the Bible gives us a lot of the information that we need about the context and the setting then. So, for example, the book of Acts is really helpful to explain to us the setting. So when we read the book of Ephesians, you know, we might not know much about Ephesus, and then we can read the book of Acts, and we can see a lot about Ephesus, and we get a lot of the setting, which makes sense, similar with Corinth and things like that. So sometimes other parts of Scripture will help you understand what was going on in the setting that help you to do that application, so that does it for you. And often the authors themselves will give you a kind of an understanding of what's going on. So like sometimes Mark, for example, in the passage I'm preaching this Sunday, there's a little brackets that the author's put in that Mark's put in and says, and by doing this, Jesus declared all food clean. He kind of gives you the information you need to know. So the principle is, you know, you don't need extra information outside the Bible. You don't need to necessarily go and do archaeology or, you know, dig up the temple of Diana in, in, in Ephesus. The information is there in the Bible. That can be helpful. Extra biblical stuff can be helpful, but it's usually there. And the book of Acts is a great go-to place, um, or there'll be stuff going on in the book itself that gives you that. Thank you. Great question. Mel, sorry. Yeah, really helpful. Thank you. Yeah, so I think just to make clear what Mel was saying, sometimes you see a, a command or an ethical principle in the Bible, and some groups will read that and say, oh, well, that was just for them then. Um, and then others will read it and say, no, 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 that was, that's for all times and all places. And so how do you settle that? Uh, the, the primary way you settle that is to take the Bible on its own terms. Um, so I think we always need to be wary of trying to impose something on the Bible. And reading the Bible on its own terms, it's very interesting how often, for example, you will see, um, for example, the authors of the Bible appealing to creation, the creation ordinances. So, for example, when Jesus is talking about um, the way that men and women were to come together in marriage, he appeals to the creation narrative and says, you know, this is the way it was made. Um, he appeals to marriage in Genesis chapter 2, and he says, this is, this is what it is in creation. And therefore, because it's in creation, it was set up as a principle for all times and all places. Paul does the same in his argument about sexuality, for example. Um, so some people will try to say, oh, well, no, that was just Paul at the time. Um, but actually, if you read it, it, he wasn't applying for all times and all places. Well, it's interesting because Paul himself refers to the nature of things and to the creation of things. So he's applying to the creation ordinances. So you just have to work hard at trying to actually read the Bible on its own terms. And often there is clarity there. I think also it's helpful sometimes to examine your own motives. We all come to the Bible and there will be passages that we love and there'll be passages where they grate with us. And we have to realize that, as we often say, what the heart wants, the will chooses, and the intellect justifies. And so sometimes there can be some really great interpretive gymnastics going on. And you're kind of thinking, yeah, but what's really driving that? I mean, for 2,000 years, the church has never interpreted it that way. So what's really changed? Has the Bible changed or has culture changed? So sometimes it's worth being honest with what's really driving the interpretation, which is why we pray humbly when we come to the Bible, Lord, speak to me, shape me. Let you speak to me and bring the agenda, not me coming to you and bringing the agenda. So there would be two things. Let the Bible speak in its own terms and beware of your own agendas as well, I think would be the other one to say. Final one, then we'll do some Apple work. Go on, Rose.
Yes. Yeah. Really helpful. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. And yeah, I want to underline that what Rose said, the importance of helping other people um, and, you know, us working at this together in a very much a communal endeavor. That's why we do this in Inspire Groups, because it's so important that we have the, the church community around us to help us, particularly when we're diverse, because things that we don't like, other people will love, and things that we, um, you know, we love, other people will grapple with and find really difficult. So actually, then we can sharpen each other up. So that's one of the real benefits of a diverse congregation and diverse Inspire Groups. Well, look... Um, over to you then. Uh, there are some recurring themes as well that are just helpful um, that I've um, put down there because primarily the Bible is about God, it's not about us. So our first application should normally be our first, you know, kind of move with the text to say, what does this teach me about God and his nature and his son, Jesus Christ? Um, beware of kind of making ourselves the hero of the story. Um, but go back in that group work at the bottom, go back to the passage and look at your theme sentence. Try now to think, why would Mark want his readers then to grasp this? So in the first century, why is Mark wanting them then to kind of grasp that actually sometimes um, people kind of get the initial part about who Jesus is, but they don't get that Jesus has to suffer, that he's a suffering Messiah? Um, and now using that principle that Mark is applying, ask, why is God saying this to us today? Okay, so how is this speaking to us today? What's it saying to us today? Because obviously our setting in 21st century London is a bit different to 1st century Jerusalem around there. Okay, over to you, and then we'll feed back. Some great discussions going on. And really good to see you kind of grappling with this. Uh, next week, we're going to continue the discussions about how we apply, particularly with the, the real change methodology. Um, just for brevity and for time, I'm not going to necessarily get you to feedback, but I'll give you a couple of thoughts of things that I'm hearing as I'm going around and discussing with you that people are talking about. So, I mean, as we think about the movement then, it would have been very tempting in that first century setting where Jews, you know, some Jews might have even be prepared to kind of say, okay, I can accept the idea that there's a Messiah and that Jesus might be that Messiah, but not a Messiah that dies on a tree. I can't accept that because that means he's cursed. And that was never, that's never in the game plan according to them. And then, you know, if you wanted to kind of win them over, then you just need to compromise on that. And Mark's saying, no, no, you, if you don't get this, you don't really get it at all. If you compromise on this, Jesus calls, says, get behind me, Satan, you lose everything. So it's a strong call from Mark um, as he writes the gospel to really make this the key thing. Now, we don't just major on the cross and Jesus' suffering because we have a particular negative disposition. It's not that at all. It's because it's central as you read scripture. Jesus says, you don't get this, you're still really blind, you don't really see. Um, and there's lots of interesting applications for us today, like churches who stop emphasizing the truth of Jesus needing to die actually they're, they're, they're really living in spiritual blindness. Um, so it's not just a kind of evangelical hang up. We're, we're hopefully seeing this from scripture. Um, there's some interesting applications as well, which is don't we often think that if I were around then, like Peter and the disciples, I would have got it all. And therefore if only my friends and my neighbors who don't see who Jesus is could have seen him and walked with him and seen the miracles. And this is a strong rebuke to us. This says, no, 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 like the people who were there then, even the apostles didn't get it without the miraculous work of Jesus to open their blind eyes in their life. So don't be fooled. Don't think that if you just put the truth in front of people and if you're just persuasive and if you're just compelling, that suddenly people go, ah, oh, Pete, I get it. No, because if you walked with Jesus and saw the miracles, you'd be like Peter. You'd be kind of saying, I'm getting it, or a special person, but I, this dying thing, why do you need to know? That's ridiculous spiritual sight. So we need to pray. So there's great applications for our prayer lives there, for our humility, for our friends, for our expectations. You, know, you, can, you can go on lots of different ways, the applications around this theme as you start to work out the particular context of where you're living. And that's part of the real excitement of engaging with God's Word. So more, as I say, next week on application. But just then to, um, to wrap up, hopefully you've seen these three stages, you know, reading and understanding, applying the Bible. So observing it, slowing yourself down, praying first and then reading and slowing yourself down, then trying to interpret it, putting it back in its context and doing that, and then doing the work of going to them then so that we can apply the principle to us today. Those really are the three kind of core stages of reading and understanding the Bible. And our hope for you guys is that, um, you know, in the, in the kind of the vernacular of 
Um, if I cook a meal for you, you'll, feel, you'll be able to feed for the meal then. But if I teach you how to cook, you'll be able to feed yourself for the rest of your life. Mark and I, you know, and the leadership team, we really want to be training you guys to be able to feed yourselves. Of course, Sunday by Sunday, we're, you know, we're preaching. And we're, but as we do that, we want you guys to be reading and working at it yourselves as well. And we want you day by day to be doing this so that you can keep feeding yourselves. There's no greater gift in some sense than you reading God's word and feeding yourself day by day and have a lifetime of rich meals from scripture. So that's our, um, that's our longing. We've got some, um, some sheets that are going to come around or yeah, that Mark's going to bring around now just as um, we kind of wrap up and as Pete Sinclair comes to Church Family News. That's, um, it's called a Faithful work, um, a Worker's Toolkit and it, it just re-emphasizes the things we've been looking at but gives you some specific top tips and things like that. So you can take it away and fold it up, put it in your Bible and it will just kind of remind you and refresh you. And also do grab me at the end if things have really kind of not made sense. That's more due to me than you, I'm sure. And um, let's try and work this together. But hopefully we'll keep doing this over the year in our Inspire groups as well. Mark's come around with those.